That says six. Just give me the signal. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. I call this October 11th meeting of the Planning Commission to order. Any changes to the agenda? Do we have a motion to approve the agenda? Make a motion to approve. All in favor? Excellent. Minutes? Any questions or comments on the minutes? Do we have a motion to approve the minutes? Make a motion to approve the minutes. Second. All in favor? Any opposed? Okay. On to Heartland Acres. All right, first one tonight is Heartland Acres. The applicant is Bill Hargrove, the property owner is AFP Properties, LLC. You'll see here by the aerial that it is 55.112 acres. The land is currently undeveloped. It's located west of Balmoral Road. So uh, Balmoral Road is part of Wellington Acres, which was a subdivision that was developed quite a few years ago. And then this section was originally supposed to be part of that subdivision, but was not developed. So the uh, developer has come in to rework this, fix that weird little cul-de-sac situation they've got going there, and uh, make it into a single family subdivision. It is zoned RUD1, and the project is comprehensive plan consistent. This is the preliminary plat for the subdivision. Uh, it has 11.08 acres of open space, 29 lots for a density of 0.53 homes per acre. We'll go through the findings here. For the first one, the site will be serviced by private wells and private septic systems as indicated on the plat. And then all lots will have to have a DHEC permit before they can be final platted. For number two, single family residential is an allowed use. RUD1 zoning district does not have a density requirement, but it is 0.53 residential units per acre. A TIA tier one has been taken care of and no mitigation is required at this time. And the development is partially bounded and accessed to the east by the existing single family subdivision. And all the roads, including Balmoral Drive, are county maintained. So sidewalks are not required along Heartland Drive and Larging Drive due to the minimum proposed lot width of more than 100 feet. The 20% open space is provided and it was required due to the location within the urban services boundary. Um, it's part of the ordinance change. RUD does not have to, if it's with outside the urban services boundary, they do not have to have open space. If it's inside the urban services boundary, it requires open space. And the final thing is a tree survey of the required tree save areas has been completed and accepted by staff. We do have one recommendation after further review with all staff. Um, the applicant must confirm that the development meets dry land and slope requirements per the open space section of the zoning code prior to final plat approval. And that is our presentation on that one. Do we have any questions? I have a question, Mary. What, what, I'm not. I don't understand that last comment about dry uh, plan and sloping on the. Sure. Uh, the uh, common open space development requirements that were adopted back in February have a requirement that the open space has to be a certain amount level. It can't all be completely sloped. Okay. Do we have a motion? I'll make a motion to approve. I'll second it. To approve with the? To approve with the? The condition? condition. Okay. Second. All right. Any further discussion? All in favor? <coughs> Thank you. On to Royal Pines. Okay, and Royal Pines, the applicant and owner is Rock Hill Charm, LLC. 
Rock Hill Charm Development, LLC. And this property is in the southeast section of the county. It is 48.26 acres and undeveloped. It's zoned RD1 and the development is comp plan consistent. So this property is north of Glasscook Road and west of Old Friendship Road. And it's a fairly rural area. So Glasscock Road is not designated as a major or minor collector or arterial. It is a local road. And that's important later. And here we have nine, this is the preliminary plat. It has almost 10 acres of common open space with 13 lots. Uh, you'll notice lot number seven is oddly shaped. It's got the large portion in the back with the more narrow portion coming up to the road. Uh, I believe the current plan is to sell lot number seven as an estate lot. Um, it could be developed in the future, but the problem is that creek crossing there is Army Corps crossing for commercial and it's cost prohibitive. So residential crossing is a little easier to take care of, but there is a possibility in the future, the land in the back could be developed. Let's see, so 13 lots with a density of 0.27 homes per acre proposed. And the findings here, so this site will also be serviced by private wells and private septic systems, and they will need a DHEC permit for each lot. RD1 requires a 20,000 square foot lot size, almost a half acre, and they do meet this lot size requirement. It's about an acre for each lot. So the proposed land use and density, um, single family is resident, single family residential is an allowed use. Uh, residential development has a maximum gross density of two dwelling units per acre, and this density is 0.27 residential units per acre. And again, a tier one TIA has been completed and no mitigation is required. And this development is partially bounded to the south by an SCDOT DOT maintained road. Sidewalks are not required along Glasscock Road by the minimum proposed lot width of more than 100 feet. And then they did provide the 20% open space as required to the zoning designation. And a tree survey has been uh, completed and accepted by staff. We also had a condition on this one after further uh, review by staff that all lots must have access to the open space amenity and mail kiosks in a safe manner via sidewalks built to county standards along Glasscock Road. And I'll go back to the preliminary plat. So down at the bottom of the preliminary plat here you can see some easements along the road and those easements are for DOT uh, shared driveways. On the right side is a path as part of the amenity, and we are proposing that developer put in a sidewalk across the front of the development so that the individual property owners can get to that path all the way to the right side and to the mail kiosks. There's two kiosks uh, because there's two sh groups of shared driveways. So each kiosk will be at each driveway. So there's two on either side. And we propose the sidewalk to provide safe access to those kiosks and for the property owner all the way to one side be able to access the path at the other side. We have any questions for staff? If there are no questions, do we have a motion? Motion to approve with the condition. All right. Do we have a second to the motion to approve with the staff's recommendation? I'll second. Okay. Any further discussion? All in favor? Okay. That's unanimous. On to Meraway Point. Good evening, Planning Commission members. I'm Josh Reinhardt. I'm the Development Services Coordinator here for our manager here for York County. And this next agenda item before you tonight is the vesting, the fifth and final vesting extension for Maryway Point. Um, the developers, Walton Development, uh, Mr. Adam Mormon, has submitted a memo to you, a letter requesting the vesting extension. Um, as you're aware, this has been before you many times. Um, this is the revised preliminary plat has been provided um, and shows everything that's been addressed in the mediation agreement that was between the county and the developer uh, within the past year. Uh, the TIA is still valid um, from the information he submitted within the, as you see, within your packet. And he has also submitted revised willingness capability letters um, from all the utility providers. So 
With that, I'll be happy to take any questions. Um, I have a couple of quick questions. Mm -hmm. The first one, during mediation, um, the developer had proposed the three acres um, to be gifted to the Bethel Lake Wiley Land Acquisition and Preservation Park District. Mm -hmm. But that mediation took place in October and the vote wasn't until November. So obviously we could they couldn't gift it to something that didn't exist yet. Mm -hmm. So in the mediation it says it's going to York County. Is there a way, since that was their initial intention and uh, Matt and I were in mediation, you know, that was acceptable to us, can we switch that from York County to that district or not? I, I just didn't know if there was a mechanism to do that since I know that was, they wanted it for recreation or conservation and then that would kind of ensure that being in that specific pocket. So I'm, I'm not exactly aware of um, specifically what occurred in that mediation, mm -hmm. but I'm happy to take a look at that and um, report back to you on it. Okay. And if, if the developer still wants to go that route, you know, I think that would be, like I said, that was the initial, their initial proposal. It just hadn't been voted into an existence until the following month. Understood, and that may just um, involve a process of the parties getting back together and discussing it, and then getting getting approval from council if, sure. if that's what all parties want. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. And then the other um, question I wanted to ask: I know the plat does not fall into the Lake Wiley Small Area Plan since it was approved prior to the Lake Wiley Small Area Plan, mm -hmm. but does since no building permits have been pulled, does the plan apply to the homes correct whatever, to be built whatever design standards that are set forth in the lake wiley overlay would apply to the homes built within okay. the subdivision thank you any other questions i had one question and this just i guess goes for the history of the area blue granite has struggled um, is a polite word to put <laughs> in that area providing service to their customers and this is uh, you know 399 additional lots I know they've given us a letter is the county pretty confident that they've gotten past their issues because I know that in the of the past several years the existing customers had trouble just using their water mm -hmm. and I don't want to exacerbate that issue we had a fairly large raw sewage spill about a mile up the road from this two weeks ago Hmm. So no, they have not. I don't know what the county stance on that is, but it was in the cove where I live. So yeah, I know it was about two weeks ago they yeah. had a fairly substantial. Well, I know, service, but. I, and I guess I know that the the county is, you know, providing water wholesale, and Rock Hill is taking care of the water treatment. But I just I get concerned that we're going to overload them yet again, and, mm -hmm. and existing customers, yeah, continue I, to suffer. We can't speak, or I can't speak for the inner workings of Blue Granite, obviously. We have, we request the letters from them saying they have the ability to serve and they provide us with that, as well as the city and the county public works department. And that's what we have to go on from our okay. department. Is there anything we can do, not with this specific one, obviously, because no. they've already gotten the letters. It's, but moving forward, is there anything we can do with Blue Granite to say, no, you clearly are, you may be willing, but you're clearly not capable. Is there any, mechanism that we can put in place that says if you've had you know x number of tonnage of sewage spill or you know water shutoffs in the last couple of months then clearly you're not capable is there anything we could look into that would ha obviously have to be at a council level um but it it seems ridiculous that they're constantly just giving willingness and capability letters when they're clearly not well I can tell you that they, they've they kind of taken a step back on some of that where they've, in some of the newer subdivisions that come forth, they only want to do it phase by phase. They only want to commit to a phase of a subdivision, and that's been for the water that I've been aware of. Um, you know, we can certainly have some discussions at staff level and see if there's, explore anything maybe um, that we can do. Yeah, just see if we could change something in the in the wording of the code so that we could put some backstops on that and say, nope, you may say you're capable, but your past performance has shown you're not. But obviously it has to be mm -hmm. something a little more tangible than us just saying, nope, they had another sewer spill. 
Yeah, I think that's something we can discuss at a staff level and, you know, maybe brainstorm a little bit and see if we can come up with something. Okay, that would be well, great. And I, I just wanted to bring that up from just the challenges that existing residents have had in that area. I don't want to yes. continue to pour it in, you know, to use that analogy, I don't want to continue to pour onto their pain by just adding more growth in a situation where a provider has lacked the capability, even though they express that they have the capability, the two don't seem to match. Yeah, and I just don't think, I mean, we're, right now we aren't in a position to say, well, I know you say you do, but we don't think you do. That's, right. I don't know that that's staff's, you know. Right. But that's why you could come in and say, okay, we have certain criteria that you have to have Correct. met. That's what I was saying. Maybe we can brainstorm with right. some if, utility if folks and see if that's. That would be great. That, that would be very helpful. There, there's several of us on the Planning Commission that would strongly encourage you to talk to the County Council about that and get some ordinance passed that, that right. gives us the authority to uh, hold up some of this stuff. Yeah. All right. Okay. Any further questions? Do we have a motion? I will make a motion to approve. Do we have a second? A second. Any further discussion? All in favor? That looks unanimous. And on to the rezoning Lenar Carolinas. All right, so we're going to move on. Uh, rezoning case 2115, Lenar Carolina's Matt Pinnell is the applicant. Uh, the location is West Highway 160 at Lighthouse Avenue, tax map 6480000003 and uh, 023. So the uh, request is to rezone approximately 20 acres from RUD to RD2. Uh, applicant wishes to develop uh, with up to 118 single-family townhomes. Uh, Lennar wants to do that. Here's the uh, vicinity map. You'll see this is uh, just north of the uh, Highway 160 Zor Road intersection and the uh, North Carolina state line is uh, just to the north of the property. Uh, here's the aerial. Uh, this is Right now, it's kind of a campground property, um, not a very attractive property from the road. Uh, this request would clean up an eyesore uh, by removing all these you know, campers and trailers and mobile homes and compliance issues that may be rela uh, related to it. Also, you'll see uh, to the south, there's a uh, gravel road, lighthouse road that uh, continues along the southern border of the property and goes and connects to a couple other houses behind it. Uh, environmental, not really a whole lot to speak of here. Um, you know, just some gently sloping land and a creek bisecting the property. So the zoning, uh, we have a lot of RUD in the area. Um, that's just how it was originally zoned back in the 80s. Of course, a lot of development has happened since then. Um, for those who live in the area, um, Highway 160, it's been expanded to four lanes with a center lane in the middle, turn lane in the middle, um, and that goes all the way up to the state line. So we've got a lot of new capacity along Highway 160. So along with that widening that was just recently finished, um, we're expecting this area to transition away from the RUD zoning you know, of the 80s. Um, expecting it to be more, you know, more dense residential development and also a mix with some commercial development as well. Um, but right now it's showing as RED because we haven't had a lot of requests in this area. Uh, so the land use plan shows there's a community center that's focused at the uh, 160 and Gold Hill uh, intersection. So uh, the Circle goes up this far, but neighborhood residential is underneath the uh, community center. So the community center, uh, I'll get back into that in a minute. Um, so here's the proposed site plan. This is all preliminary, so there's still some work to be done to meet the code requirements. Um, but this is um, kind of give you an idea how things may be laid out. 
Uh, you see all the townhome lots and some open space and such. So the uh, land use plan is community center with neighborhood residential underlying. Um, both of them would allow for apartments, townhomes, condominiums, um, a mix of residential. Um, so they're both supportive of this kind of land use. So we're recommending approval because they are supportive of, of the comprehensive plan, which um, neighborhood residential or community okay. center both talk about townhomes as you know fitting in that, those areas. And as I said before, with the extension of the utilities, um, as well as the widening of 160, we expect this area to transition to a you know, higher density residential, um, not the rural residential that you see in the zoning code today. So with that, any questions? Are there sidewalks along 160? There are now, yeah, they're back of curb. Okay, the widening of 160, uh, potentially that area where it was widened um, in front of this um, development would be about a half a mile. Um, because you go up to the state line when you come out to the right, up to the left, just past Soar Road, you've got that part of 160 that was already widened. And then you go to Gold Hill Road, which takes in a tremendous amount of traffic already. So the people, when they're coming out of the development, um, they're not just going to stay on that half a mile of potentially five lanes. They've got to go to the right or they have to go to the left. And if they work Charlotte, Fort Mill, Rock Hill, they're going to go to Gold Hill or up to the state line, which turns into a two-lane road. Mm -hmm. And I just uh, am very concerned about an already taxed area of Gold Hill Road anyway, that intersection coming out of Tiga K, all those people coming out of Tiga K. I think you said you had findings of 700 and... 54. 754. 754 potential coming in, going out. Um, I don't see how that area will manage that. Okay, that's one thing. The second thing is the Fort Mill schools, um, Mr. Epps has great concern about adding more children to the Fort Mill, an already taxed uh, Fort Mill school system. And he you know, stated that in his letter. So I don't think that was, that his, his um, objections have been looked at either tonight. So those were my two th my two observations. And I'll, and I will remind you too that Fort Mill does have school impact fees that help to cover <laughs> those kinds of expenses. I know all about okay. that impact fee. Let's go talk to the council about that. <laughs> um, I ask, I also have questions specifically about the TIA. How can 754 proposed new you know trips in a 24 hour not impact that area? 754 is a lot, um, particularly pulling out onto a road, although it does have a, you know, a turn lane, there wouldn't be turning lanes into the development and there wouldn't be a light. And, as and there is a light at Zor, so there's no way you're going to put a light right. that close. Exactly. And I, I'm worried, I mean, I think that there's already some discussion about when North Carolina does catch up and expand. I know previously there's been some talk of like not allowing left turns out of Hamilton Place which is, you know, just over the North Carolina border. Um, I know that that was at least in the talks a few years ago. So how does that impact, for example, like our buses, our school buses and things? I feel like the traffic in that area, while yes, it is ripe for development, I don't know that it's ripe for huge, you know, multifamily development just from a, just from a traffic standpoint alone. 
let mm -hmm. alone from a school, you know, standpoint. So just a procedural, um, if we're going to have discussion, we should vote and then have discussion. Okay. So, or make the proposal, you know, make a, make a motion, then have discussion. So would one of you like, ladies like to make a motion? I make a motion we don't approve this. Okay. Do we have a second? What, what, what was the motion? Motion to deny yeah, the to rezoning. Deny. I, I second it. Okay, now we're, now discussion. <laughs> I would, you know, I mean, for the two reasons mainly that I've mentioned, I have concerns. But mostly, if Mr. Epps is telling us that, you know, that our schools can't take it, and I do know, because I have a child actually at the middle school that would be impacted, with the coming home, the, with the development that's coming around there, that school is going to be over capacity, I mean, quickly. And then those kids would probably get shunted to Gold Hill, which is typically over capacity and already mm -hmm. shunting kids to Tiga K. So I, th I feel like if we approve something of this magnitude in this area right now without more ideas about school and traffic, we are just basically passing the buck along to the school district to you know, figure out, again, how to bus these kids or, or, or shuttle these kids, which eats into their school day and their education. So I don't know that I can, can could vote for that because And of that all reason. the schools would be to the left, coming out and turning they, left against they're, they're all they're that traffic. They're left because the North Carolina line is, is right there. Is That's right correct. there. Yeah. And so they've got to go across three lanes of traffic to turn left with no caution light, anything. Yeah, I just don't, I really don't understand. Can, do, in rush hour traffic. How does 754 houses not, or trips not impact okay. that? I guess 118 the, town. The question would be for Chris: is, Does the traffic report accurately reflect, like the AM? So most of the traffic would come out and go left. Correct. Um, it accurately <clears throat> it uh, reflects, um, and it's actually lower, um, and this might just be due to um, the current state. But uh, existing traffic currently is is lower, um, and it just. There's not any impacts. Um, no warrants are met for a turn lane. Um, not even like a right turn. And the peak, a... the peak hour information was not in here. It's, um, as far as ex existing, because it doesn't. Currently no, it exist. didn't show what the peak hour. The the previous one we did with the TIA, exactly. the first one, showed that the 29 lot subdivision would have 30 peak hour trips. This one didn't give us peak hour trips. It only said 754 daily, which is just over six trips a day per residence, whereas the one earlier tonight, it was nine and a half trips per residence on a daily. And then there was no peak hour on this one, but the other one is almost one for one. So say peak hour, that's 118 peak hour if you're doing it you know, similar to the previous one tonight, which is a huge concern. Is this at the uh, at the access side access? Right, and there's only one road accessing the 118 townhomes, so they're all going to be coming out that one entrance with no light or with no control right. across three four lanes of traffic. It's just, I mean, truthfully, I drove that area tonight on my way here. Not that I don't drive it almost every day, but just to get a feel during about 4:30, 5 o'clock. It's, it's busy. It's crazy. It's very busy. Mm -hmm. Any further discussion? I, the other, the, I guess my other question, which I, I don't really understand, is you know, in the report, it shows that there's capacity in the schools, but then the superintendent of the schools says there's not. I don't. I think he's basing that on also other approved developments that are coming in and the number of students you're going to be seeing from that, because we have quite a few that are still building in the area. Well, and truthfully, those, I think, again, I can speak just because my kids are in those schools in that area, and I also have friends that teach in the, a few of those schools, but, I mean, they gained that, you know, 100 to 120 students over the course of the year last year. So, you know, it's not a static number. That are, right, and doing traffic counts right now, people are still working from home, so your traffic counts, you know, as you said, it's a little lower 
Well, we actually used the um, 2019 where the volumes were a little bit higher. Okay. Um, and we compared them with the 2021. And so it's actually uh, um, the report's kind of reflecting a little more more volume than it would be um, if we use compared it to current traffic. Current traffic? It's still a lot. So just so I understand, like um, we were saying earlier that the TIA for the previous development had a larger number of trips associated with each household and this one has less. Is there a standard for so, each company that comes in and does that? Because I know different well, companies do it. Townhomes typically generate less traffic than single family. So that's probably why you're seeing a little bit less due to townhomes. The thought, it's a, it's a the thought being that there maybe are less children living there, so they're not like running people back and forth. Just in the ITE code, they, they generate less volume is how it, it's, um, it's shown in the, um, in the manual. So single family typically generates more, just I guess, you know, maybe do more yard work, I don't know, but they have higher uh, volume on single family. That's good to know. You, the, the applicant may be here if you have questions about the number of bedrooms or unit size or anything like that. Any further discussion? No. Okay, so all in favor of the motion to deny the rezoning? Okay, that looks unanimous. All right. Any questions on the tracking sheet? All right, do we have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. All right. Second. They, <laughs> I'll take the second. You take the second. All right, all in favor. Thank you.